Okay, as, as folks continue to stream in, I'll go ahead and get some housekeeping notes out of the way. Welcome to PMP Live. My name is Chelsea Lake. I'm a member of the events team at Politics and Prose Bookstore. Welcome. So at any point during the event, uh, you can click on the link that I'll be dropping in the chat to purchase Life Lived Wild Adventures at the Edge of the Map. You can ask a question by clicking on the Q&A, which can be found in the menu along the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everybody's question, uh, but I apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. We are delighted to offer closed captioning for this event uh, via Zoom's auto captioning service. To access captions, simply click on the live transcript, transcript option also along the bottom of your screen. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. At the beginning of his memoir, Life Lived Wild, Adventures at the Edge of the Map, Rick Ridgway tells us that if you add up all his many expeditions, he spent over five years of his life sleeping in tents, quote, and most of that in small tents pitched in the world's most remote regions, end quote. It's not a boast so much as an explanation. Whether at elevation or raising a family back at sea level, those years taught him, he writes, quote, to distinguish matters of consequence from matters of inconsequence, end quote. He leaves it to his readers though, to do, this, to do the sorting out of which is which. A master storyteller, this long awaited memoir is the bookend to Ridgway's impressive list of publications, including Seven Summits, The Shadow of Kilimanjaro, and The Big Open. Rick Ridgway is an outdoor adventurer, writer, and advocate for sustainability and conservation initiatives. For 35 years, Rick served as the Vice President of Environmental Affairs and then Vice President of Public Engagement at Patagonia. During his tenure, he has worked with teams to develop and launch environmental and sustainability initiatives, including Freedom to Roam, the Footprint Chronicles, the Responsible Economy Campaign, and Warn Wear. He, has, he is also founding chair of the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, today the largest apparel, footwear, and home textiles trade organization in the world. Rick is recognized as one of the world's foremost mountaineers. With three companions, he was the first American to summit K2. He has written seven books, numerous magazine stories, and produced and directed dozens of television shows. National Geographic honored Rick with its Lifetime Achievement in Adventure Award, and he is also the recipient of the Explorers Club's, Explorers Club's Lowell Thomas Award. Now, before I turn the screen over to Rick, we have a one more welcome and intro from Rick's friend, Jimmy Chin, via video. Hello and good evening, uh, Jimmy Chin here. And it is my privilege and honor to introduce uh, my amazing friend and mentor, Rick Ridgway. Rick is someone that I consider as one of the great adventurers of our time. Uh, I've grown up reading his books, uh, his magazine articles, and I had the great fortune of joining him on a National Geographic expedition to the Changteng Plateau in northwestern Tibet. It was on this trip that Rick took me under his wing and taught me how to film. Uh, when I was first asked to join the expedition and told that I was going to be the filmer on, on the trip, uh, taking the place of the great filmmaker David Brashears, I told uh, Rick immediately, just to be transparent, that sounds great. I would really love to join this expedition, but I've never filmed before. And Rick said to me, and this is a quote that I've lived by since, he said, commit 
and figure it out. And that's what I've done. Uh, if you notice any of the special thanks at the end of my films, Meru, Free Solo, and most recently The Rescue, uh, you will see Rick's name prominently featured. Uh, it is Rick's mentorship and friendship uh, that's really pushed me in my career and he's been there for me through thick and thin. Um, so I'm very excited about his new book recounting many of his grand adventures, which is here. It's a beautiful new book, Life Lived Wild. Uh, I think I had a little bit to do with um, the genesis of the book, only in the sense that I had suggested he uh, start his own Instagram account, which, you know, might seem a little old, uh, new school for an old school guy, but that's what he did. And I think uh, through that process, um, his daughter and all of us were really encouraging for him to share some of his amazing, amazing stories. Uh, some of which I've gotten to hear firsthand from Rick, maybe laying in a tent, but you get to hear it today live. So uh, I hope you enjoy uh, this conversation with Rick and I'm going to let him take it away. Folks, Rick Ridgeway. <laughs> Okay, the screen is yours. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chelsea. And uh, maybe I'll just go to my headshot here before I share my screen. Uh, and I want to really <clears throat> thank Jimmy for uh, that uh, intro. Uh, <laughs> one thing he left out was how um, when I invited him on the trip, he said, told me later, his first thought was, wow, what did I do to deserve this? And two weeks into the trip, pulling a 275 pound rickshaw at 16,000 feet over an unexplored corner of Northwest Tibet, he said to himself, what did I do to deserve this? <clears throat> well, thank you to Politics and Prose for hosting me uh, this evening. Uh, and <clears throat> to uh, Chelsea for your lovely introduction. Uh, give me just a, a moment to share my screen and go through the tech process here as I start my presentation this evening. Um, is that looking okay? Actually, it's not on my end, so hold on. Got to... Okay, is that looking okay? You don't see it. Okay, hold on. There, did that work? <clears throat> As Jimmy told you in the introduction, I'm a little old school, so um, you'll have to bear with me. Okay, let's try that. Is that full screen? Okay. Well, great. Thank you all again for being here this evening. And, um, you know, as Chelsea said in her introduction, after five years of living in tents in some of the most remote places in the world, I learn to distinguish, as she said, what I call matters of consequence from matters of inconsequence. And I'm assuming that all of you here tonight could benefit from knowing better how to separate things that are consequential from those things that aren't. And if you think about it, you might come to the same conclusion I have that it's about as important a life skill as we could own. And I'm not claiming that I've got it totally figured out by any means. Um, like all of us, I'm on a journey. <clears throat> And it's a journey that started uh, as a young teenager when my mother gave me a subscription to National Geographic. And I read a cover story about the first American ascent of Mount Everest. And this was in 1963. And inside was a photo of Jim Whitaker, the first American to reach the top. And I decided that's who I wanted to be. So I bought an ice axe and crampons just like Jim Whitaker's and 
an instruction manual how to use my new gear. And that made my mother's maternal radar start to bleep. So for my high school graduation present, she sent me to Outward Bound in the Oregon Cascades where I learned some basic mountaineering skills. And I was more than ever uh, hooked so that after college, I used every dollar I could earn doing odd jobs to climb in places like Yosemite. And I also started going to Peru where I learned the fundamentals of high altitude mountaineering. And I met another climber, you know, more experienced than me named Chris Chandler, who took me under his wing. And a year later, Chris called to say that he had gotten both of us on an expedition to the Himalayas. And I said, the Himalayas? I mean, that was, that was my dream. What's the mountain? I asked. <clears throat> he paused for a minute, a minute and then said, Everest. And I remembered that National Geographic article I read when I was in my early teens and, and that photo of my hero, Jim Whitaker on the summit. And here I was at age 25, following his footsteps. And the expedition was filmed for a television special and the camera crew followed Chris and me through the Kumbu Icefall. It's the most dangerous part of the climb and today Sherpas put the route in for clients who can pay over a hundred grand to say that they've climbed Everest. But back then we had to figure it out ourselves. 1247, September 2nd. In only four days, they have built a route through the ice fall where it has taken some expeditions weeks. But the top of the ice fall is hardly the summit of Mount Everest. So for the next three weeks, we made good progress. And a week after that, I was on my way to the summit. And then just below the 26,000 foot level, uh, just below that 26,000 foot level, my lungs suddenly congested and I had no choice but to go down. My, climb, my climbing partner, Chris, went on to reach the top, climbing in hurricane winds. And, and with that, the expedition was over. And as I started the long journey down the mountain and then back home, I wondered if I had it in me to do what it would take to be a high altitude mountaineer. If I tried another big mountain, would I have the same issue with my lungs? And, if I had a chance, but I had a chance to find out a year later when I got a call from Jim Whitaker, my boyhood hero. And Jim was leading an expedition to K2, uh, the second highest peak on the planet. And today regarded as the highest high altitude mountain in the world to climb. Well, it was a good thing we didn't know that back then because even the trek to base camp was hard. It was uh, 110 miles with over 450 porters carrying our supplies for nearly four months the trek and the climb would take. And after two weeks, we rounded a corner and there it was, K2, rising like a giant pyramid. And we started trekking, as we started trekking up the glacier, that fear I had after Everest started to come back. I remember my lungs getting congested and I felt that uncertainty, not knowing if it would happen again. And even if I stayed healthy, there was just the challenge of the mountain itself. Well, we set up our base camp and the weather held as we started up. There were 14 of us on the team and unlike Everest, there were no Sherpas this time. We set up camp one and, and then camp two and some of the teams carried supplies while others pushed the route further up the mountain. We were now ready to tackle the knife edge, a ridge almost a mile long and an average elevation of over 23,000 feet. We only managed to get started, however, when the weather turned. And at first we stayed in our high camp, hoping the storm would be short, but we were using food and fuel that we had worked hard to carry up. And after four days, we had no choice but to go back all the way down to base camp. The storm lasted over a week and when it finally cleared, we had to work hard to get back to our previous high point. Finally, we were ready to cross the knife edge, which was also the precise border between Pakistan and China. After four days, we got to the other end of the ridge, but there was no obvious place to set up our camp. So we had no choice but to hack off the top of the ridge to make 
platforms for our tents. And I went inside to start our stove and, and I heard my climbing partner outside yell to me, hey, this is great. I yelled back, what's great? Well, I'm taking a pee into Pakistan and a shit into China without even moving. <laughs> well, we were ready to push to the next camp, but before we could even start, the next storm hit. And again, we had no choice but to lower all the way down the ropes to our base camp. And this time the storm lasted seven days. And when it was finally cleared, we climbed back up the ropes and, and it took over three days to dig out all the tents. And now looking up, we still had the summit head wall in front of us and tempers were getting thin. And so was the food supply. We had been on the mountain for over a month. We pushed up to the next camp at 25,000 feet, but we only arrived when the next storm hit. And once more, we had to lower all the way down to base camp. This one lasted five days, maybe six. And with each day, I had to struggle to safeguard my optimism and commitment. But when it cleared, four of us were picked to make an 11th hour attempt at the top. We were nearly out of food and supplies. We put in one more camp at 26,000 feet. And the next day the weather held but the climbing was hard, including one section at about 27,000 feet where we had to climb steep rock covered with ice. And we had only decided to try and climb the mountain with, uh, without oxygen, which no one had ever done before. So that each step took a really concentrated effort. But finally, I, I reached the top. The weather was perfect, but I was so exhausted. I had to keep telling myself that this was an important moment that I needed to appreciate it and try to remember it. But all I could think about was getting the energy for the descent because it took us five days to get down. And getting into one camp, I literally had to crawl the last hundred feet, but, but we reached base camp and we were greeted by our friends. We had been at or above 18,000 feet for 68 days. I had taken everything I had in me to do it and, I'd lost over 30 pounds and I was so skinny I could pinch my fingers around my biceps. On summit day in the pre-dawn, it had been 40 below zero as we left camp and my fingers were frostbitten, but fortunately nothing had to be amputated. And we had been uh, at that point uh, uh, for five days and nights uh, above 26,000 feet, what climbers call the death zone. But we'd made it the third ascent of K2 by a new route and we climbed the hardest high altitude mountain in the world and, and we'd done it one step at a time. So I was fully back in the game. And the next year in 1980, I was invited to the People's Republic of China. The first year the country opened to foreign mountaineers and I was part of a team that included Yvonne Schoenard who by then was a close friend. We were going to a region in Eastern Tibet no Westerner had been to in over 50 years to a attempt a 25,000 foot peak called Minyakonka that had been climbed only twice ever. And it was my kind of trip to a remote region, little explored with a good team of close friends, including one named Jonathan Wright, who was also my business partner because we were a writer photographer team. And things were going okay until one day at 20,000 feet, we were caught in an avalanche, swept down the mountain over 1500 feet. And I was sure there was no way I was going to get out of it alive. But then the snow slowed and stopped and I was injured, but not as badly as Jonathan. I tried to keep him alive, but after a half hour, he died in my arms and we buried him under a mound of rocks next to where he died. And, and we went home and, and I went into a deep introspection. Should I keep climbing? I didn't know if I could. And it took me a couple of years to think it through, to think about what I learned, what I'd taken from the high elevations and brought down to my life at sea level. And I thought about how you learn on a climb to make a plan, but how inevitably stuff goes wrong and you have to adjust. I thought about tenacity, about how on a big mountain like K2, you get to the top one step at a time. And maybe the most important lesson, the one that was easiest to ignore because it seemed the most banal while in, while in truth, it was actually the hardest to learn because it was so omnipresent. And that was how the real goal isn't the summit, but, but it's the footsteps that it takes to get there. 
And those were some of the lessons I learned over the years. But, but after that avalanche, after Jonathan died, and I thought I was going to die, I realized I, I had changed. Sometimes I was waking up amazed just to be alive. And I remember one day walking from my car to my office and, and stopping in the parking lot just to feel the difference between the side of my face that was in sunshine and the other side that was in shadow. I was in a way feeling like I had been reborn with a, a new awareness of just being alive. And with that a new awareness, how, how quickly any of us can cannot be alive. Then a few years later, I ran into that poem by Mary Oliver, her famous one called Summer's Day with its famous last line that really summarized my challenge. Tell me, she commanded, tell me what you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. And that was my challenge, a challenge that included the decision whether I was gonna go back to climbing, but. But meanwhile, I had my professional life working as a writer and, and filmmaker and photographer. And, and Jonathan's family asked me to complete a story for National Geographic that he and I had been working on about the newly chartered Mount Everest National Park. I decided to do it and to do it for Jonathan and his wife and, and his baby daughter that he had left behind. So I returned to Kathmandu and I was in the bar in the Yak and Yeti Hotel when I met a woman and bought her a drink and she wanted to know where I lived. And I said I, was, I had a quaint beach cottage just south of Santa Barbara when the reality was I lived in a surfer shack on a low rent beach just north of Oxnard. But the line worked and less than a year later, Jennifer and I married. And I would come to realize that it wasn't a coincidence that I made this shift in my life so soon after Jonathan had died in my arms and so soon after I'd nearly died myself. Nor was it chance that Jennifer and I started our, our family right away. But that made it even more difficult to decide whether to return to mountaineering. But, but mountaineering was what I did. and So much of who I had become was from my time in the mountains, my time in nature. So even with a family, I had to ask whether the rewards were worth the risks. And if the right people with the right project came along, would I consider going back? And what would Jennifer think? And then it happened when I got a call from two guys named Frank Wells, uh, the guy on the right, who at that time was president of Warner Brothers and Dick Bass, who owned the Snowbird Ski Resort. And by coincidence, they learned that both shared a lifelong dream to climb the highest mountain on each of the seven continents. And they had very little climbing experience though. And they were both nearly 50 years old. So they would need guides and help organizing the expeditions. And they invited me to join them on any of the seven climbs. But I asked my wife, Jennifer, what she thought. And she said, maybe the bigger risk is, is not going, not staying true to who I was. And maybe just as importantly, not meeting new people. She explained that even though I would be guiding Frank and Dick on the climbs, maybe they could in turn guide me in new directions. And it wasn't the first time I would realize that in a marriage of two people, one plus one can add up to a lot more than two. So I decided to go on three of the seven summit expeditions, starting with Aconcagua, the highest peak in South America, where we all made the summit, including Yvonne, who was also on the trip. And then from there, I went on to Everest, where this time my, my role wasn't as a guy, but I was a color commentator for a TV special. And the expedition was successful, but Frank and Dick missed the summit, even though Dick came really close. But they went on and climbed the highest peaks in North America and Africa and Australia and, and Europe, where you see them here on the summit of Mount Elbrus. The last one on the list was the Vincent Massif, the highest mountain in Antarctica. And I joined again as a guide, and we were the first private expedition ever to reach the interior of Antarctica. We all made the summit, and this is a shot of me on top of what was only then the third ascent of Vincent. But Frank and Dick had missed Everest, and even though Frank had to go back to work, Dick went back to Everest and at age 55 reached the summit, becoming the first to climb the seven summits. And back at base camp, he called me on the satellite phone and he said, Rick, it, it goes to show you 
the second half, and I knew that was his shorthand for life after 50. The second half can be and should be the best half. So Jennifer had been right. I wasn't simply the guide helping Dick and Frank, but they were my guides, inspiring me with a new confidence uh, to live my life in wild places of the world and also uh, to commit at the same time to being uh, there uh, between my trips for my, for my family. And it wasn't easy and it wasn't without friction. But Jennifer and I made it work because filming and photography and writing about living life wild was, that was how I made my living. And it wasn't just in the mountains either, but it was in the jungles where on this trip, we made the first crossing of Borneo at its widest, 800 miles as the hornbill flew, but over 2000 miles following all the winds and bends and the rivers. And on another jungle adventure, our objective was a secluded granite spire that rose 2,000 feet out of the Amazon in a region of jungle 80 miles beyond the last Yanomami village. And, and that was a village that had been visited by anthropologists only in the previous decade. We hired several Yanomami to help us carry gear. And one day, one of them uh, dropped his pack and headed out into the forest. And, I followed him realizing he'd heard a troop of monkeys. He stopped and from a distance, I saw him calling to make the monkeys curious. And then sure enough, they came in for a closer look and, and he drew his arrow and shot and missed. But the image was stuck in my head like a song you can't get rid of. And finally, I realized what it was. It was the image of who I used to be. There were more adventures, including one in Africa, climbing Kilimanjaro, the highest peak on that continent. But the summit was where this trip only started. From the top, we walked 500 kilometers east, all the way to the Indian Ocean. We crossed the bushlands of the twin Savo National Parks together the size of Israel. It was a 500 kilometer trek and on foot and eye level with wild animals that put me a few rungs down the food chain. And I reflected on conserva conservation efforts around the world to save wild lands and wildlife. And, and that led to an expedition that used my outdoor skills to help save a species called the shiru, an antelope looking creature that's actually a goat that lives in the most remote margins of the Tibetan plateau. The animals were endangered because poachers were killing them for their fur that was woven into expensive shawls that had become a fashion hit. And biologists were concerned that if the poachers discovered the Shiru's calving grounds, it would be game over for the endangered species. And each summer, the females migrated to an unknown place to have their babies. The biologists needed to discover where it was so they could persuade the Chinese to protect it, but it was in an area completely uninhabited and they couldn't get there. But what if some of my climbing buddies and I followed the migration on foot, carrying our supplies and custom made rickshaws. We had to walk nearly 300 miles. And at the start, each cart weighed over 275 pounds. And by the way, that's Jimmy in the background in that orange uh, parka. The average elevation was 16,000 feet in the afternoon sun melted the top of the permafrost so that pulling and pushing the carts felt well, felt like pulling and pushing a 275 pound cart. And nearly a month later, we found this high snow, snow dusted plateau and, and there they were, thousands of Shiru congregated in a place where nobody could bother them to have their babies. And we documented the calving grounds and wrote an article and made a movie for National Geographic and the publicity convinced the Chinese to create a protected area around the calving grounds. And since then, the Shiru have been increasing. The conservation of wildlife and wild lands was becoming increasingly important to me, in large part from what I was learning from uh, two of my frequent companions on the trip, uh, Yvonne Chouinard uh, on the right and Doug Tompkins had been close friends and climbing partners since the early 1960s. They had also started iconic climbing and outdoor equipment companies. Doug making sleeping bags and packs and later parkas and jackets. 
and he called his new company the North Face. And a few years later, Yvonne started his own company that he called Patagonia, a name he had given the company because of an adventure that he and Doug had made when they were both still in their late 20s. And that trip had a huge influence on them. And that in turn had a huge ripple effect on me and many of my outdoor buddies. I picked up a 16 millimeter Bolex camera to record the trip, loaded the car up with surfboards and climbing gear and took off for a 10,000 mile trip down south. I think from the time we decided to go, it was like two weeks before we went. We bought this old van and took off from Ventura. 1968, you gotta remember that Pan American Highway was pretty wild. It was dirt road from Mexico City all the way south. It was like being in Montana, Wyoming, a hundred years ago. Here we're in an area that's the size of the whole American West with no people. For those of us that grew up going out into the wilds of the world where nature was basically untouched, we got into our souls a sense of beauty. That trip had a big influence on both Doug and I. It kind of set the course for what we're going to do later in life. For me, it was the best trip of my life. Well, the beauty of nature was a big influence on the design aesthetic at Esprit. Uh, and Doug and his wife, Susie, uh, built that into a billion dollar brand. And by the way, Doug is the one who taught me that phrase that I'd passed on to Jimmy Chin, uh, the one about committing and then figuring it out. But Doug was increasingly disillusioned with making a lot of stuff that nobody really needed. And when his marriage fell apart, he sold his half of the business and moved to a remote part of Southern Chile and started buying wildlands to convert them into national parks. He then fell in love with a woman named Chris McDevitt who ran Yvonne's company, Patagonia. That's Chris on, on the right. And she was also one of my best friends. So she left Patagonia the company and moved to Patagonia the place to join Doug. And, and the two of them would go on over the next 25 years to create over 16 million acres of new national parks in, in Chile and Argentina. And it was the biggest conservation win by private individuals in the history of conservation. And I was privileged to have a part in the effort from the beginning. And I was also fortunate to have a chance to join Yvonne's company, Patagonia. And like my mentors, Doug and Yvonne, apply what I had learned from years in nature, the climber and explorer to, to the way we ran the company. Because fundamentally, Patagonia is in business to use business as an agent for environmental protection. And Yvonne, explains why we do that, quoting his mentor, David Brower, who once said that there is no business on a dead planet. And in Patagonia, I also got to work with terrific people all committed to the same higher call. And those people included the interns that join the company each summer and fill about 10 positions from a pool of about 10,000 applicants that we had each year, making it harder to get into a Patagonia internship position and to get into Harvard. And then one year, one of the interns included a young woman who was an active outdoor athlete who at the same time had just turned 20. And she had been barely a year old when her father, Jonathan, had died in my arms and after that avalanche in Tibet. And Jonathan had named her Asia after his favorite place in the world. And after we had buried him in that remote grave, Vaughn and I had stayed in touch, seeing her every year or two as she grew up, trying to be fill-in fathers. And now she was an intern, and I knew before the summer was that over, she would want to know more about her, her father, because after he died, her mother had 
kind of shut them out of their memory, out of their lives. And sure enough, Asia asked me if we could have a chat and I didn't hold back. I told her about her father, about the avalanche, about how I held him in my arms, giving him mouth to mouth, trying to keep him alive. And, and she thanked me, but, but then she said that wasn't the only reason she wanted to talk to me. She said the other was that she had a favor. She wanted me to take her to the mountain where her father had died to climb the flank and, and find his grave. Well, I told her I needed to think about that. So I went to my wife and I asked her, and she said, well, of course you're going because Asia's is not asking you just to find her father. She's, she's asking you to be her father. And I knew that if Jonathan had lived, he would have taken his daughter Asia on some of his trips. And certainly those trips would have included Asia, the place. So that's what we did. We journeyed to the Everest region where I had many Sherpa friends who had been Jonathan's friends, who then became Asia's friends. We ventured to Western Tibet in the mountains that had hardly been explored where we had to endure 60 mile an hour winds to climb a 21,000 feet foot peak that was unnamed and at least until that day, unclimbed. And then in Eastern Tibet, we approached the flank of Minyakonka where her father had died. And it had been 20 years and I wasn't sure I could find the grave. And finally on a high barren buttress, we found it. Only now it had been disturbed probably by a snow leopard. So we gathered my old friend's bones, his daughter and me, and we reburied him and strung fresh prayer flags over the grave. And after saying our own prayers and making our own thanksgivings, we started the long journey home. And the full trip, the full pilgrimage took two months. And in that time, I shared with Asia the stories and the lessons from those stories that I knew her father would have shared with her. There are many of the same lessons that I shared with you guys this evening about how you have to make a plan, but know that stuff happens so that you need to change or adjust. How you get to the top, that one step at a time, one foot in front of the other, how you need to go about your life knowing that it's not about the summit, but it's the footsteps to get there that it's the way you get there. That in your work life, as well as your home life, your life has to have a purpose. And that purpose needs to be more than just about you, but it needs to be about how you can be more than just yourself. So knowing what you know now, I'll challenge you guys the same way all those years before I challenged myself <clears throat> to tell me what it is that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. So thank you again for being here this evening and I'm going to unshare my screen <laughs> and then we can start our questions and answers. So let me find my cursor here. Hold on. And while he's doing that, I'll remind everybody that the Q&A feature is located along the bottom of the screen. We, we have some nice questions in there now, but we, we've got 20 minutes left, so we might have time for more. So I encourage you to, if something comes up for you, to include your question with everyone else's. So are you are you ready to get started? Yeah. Um, so I'm in the Q&A part, Chelsea, and the first one, first question is, uh, what other nature or adventure writers uh, inspire you? And, you know, Jimmy in the intro uh, told uh, you guys that I was an old school guy and my main writing mentor is the wonderful old school writer, Peter Matheson. And 
his book, Snow Leopard, had a big influence on me when I was in my early 20s. Uh, and, and, and Mike, when I finished that book, I, I challenged myself to see if I could even come close to writing uh, in the way that he did. Um, later in my life, I, I got to know Peter personally. It was one of my, my more treasured acquaintances, uh, but he was my main inspiration. <clears throat> and then um, what's left on your bucket list? <laughs> Anywhere you still want to go? You know, it's interesting. Um, maybe some of you had the same experience uh, with COVID, with uh, the change in all of our lives where um, we were at home, where uh, if you were like me, uh, our time in nature was necessarily the time that we got out of our houses and went to our backyards, uh, literally and figuratively. And, and that's what I did for the last two years. Um, I got deeper and deeper into my extended backyard uh, where I live in Southern California, a little town called Ojai. And the more I explored my backyard, the more I learned how complex and wondrous it was uh, in a way that I never appreciated before. So it had the interesting corollary consequence of dampening my enthusiasm to really travel the world as much as I used to. And I'm just finding more and greater pleasures into learning more about uh, places that I thought previously were familiar and on closer examination or maybe not as familiar as I thought they were, where there's still so much for me to learn about. And then uh, the next question is, uh, what do you look for in a mentor in, in mountaineering? And on the flip side, how can one best be a mentor in the mountains? And um, when I was starting out, uh, you know, I needed uh, people, I needed mentors to really teach me how to be a mountaineer. And in those years, um, it was a lot harder to, to find people to do that. Uh, there just wasn't as many people, at least where I was in California, uh, climbing that it was easy to, easy to find them. So certainly it was finding people that helped me learn you know, how to do it and how to, how to do it safely and, and how to stay alive. But after I learned how to do that, um, my other mentors came along. And as I said in the presentation, two of them, the most important to me were uh, Doug Tompkins and, and Yvonne Chouinard. And what they both taught me was not how you do it, but, but why you do it. <laughs> and, and they started, they started helping me understand what I could really take from a deep immersion into the wild part of the world and, and how, if you really pay attention to what you're learning, it can change your life when you take those learnings with you back down to sea level, as I, as I hope I've shared with you this evening in, in the presentation. So, you know, my mentors became guides uh, much more than just who could best teach me how to be a mountaineer. So another of you this evening asked that, or said that it was great to be listening to me speak. And as a video producer himself or herself, I, I love reading about the beginning of adventure video production and your part in creating and developing that genre. And my question is this, I would love to go on expeditions like yourself though, due to a, an autoimmune disorder. I, I've had to limit my travels and projects to shorter trips. And what advice could you give a budding producer with just a decade under his belt? And how would you commit and figure it out uh, in this scenario? And gosh, um, you know, I think probably all of you here this evening know that, um, you know how important it is to, you know, really understand ourselves and through that understanding to really realize what we're good at and, and more importantly, even maybe what we're, what we're not good at and to with what we are good at and the tools that are in our chest, uh, um, keep our antennas up for um, opportunities. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of people, who have uh, fortunate breaks in any endeavor in life like filmmaking, uh, often look at some people who have made it and think about how lucky they were to have had a chance encounter. But 
you know, luck's an int a, a curious thing because you could also argue that maybe there isn't even any such thing as luck, but rather it's the ability to recognize an opportunity when it when it comes along, and we all have probably a lot more opportunities than any of us recognize. So keeping that that radar up for anything that matches what your skills are uh, would be maybe my main advice. And then another of you asked, um, uh, uh, said, have your experiences impacted your feelings on climate activism? And any thoughts on how we can do right by these sacred places? And thank you so much for that question. I, I mean, I, I'm really sincere in appreciating you asking that. I was kind of hoping somebody would. Because at the ending of this, when I said, tell me you know, what you guys are going to do with your one wild and precious life, I realized that that could be, my, my purpose here could be misinterpreted. That, and, and, and in fact, it could even piss some of you guys off maybe because you're looking at this guy who's had this kind of pr privileged life of going on all these adventures all his life and seeing all these wild places, some which don't even exist anymore. And here he is challenging us to tell him what we're gonna do <laughs> when there's no way we can follow in his footsteps. So I didn't, I didn't do that with the intention at all of suggesting that you needed to try to do anything close to what I did. But what are you gonna do with your one wild and precious life? That is, you know, Mary Oliver had such an important question for all of us. And one thing all of us can do uh, is do what we can collectively to solve climate change. And, um, you know, a minute ago, to uh, the filmmaker, I said, you know, understand what you're good at. And I um, take that to apply to climate change. One of the things that I focused on in the last two or three years is work with a emerging NGO that I chair called One Earth, oneearth.org. And uh, I've been with this group for years now, and we've raised a lot of money to uh, fund scientists, uh, big teams of scientists um, who have gone deep to measure in three categories of actions what all of us can do to solve climate change. And we're, and we're kind of coming up with science-based answers. And it's not as complicated or impossible as the challenge might seem. And it's this, if we can really scale the conversion to renewable energy, uh, to reduce emissions, if we can really scale the protection of wild areas so nature can go about its business that it knows best of using nature to sequester carbon in protected areas. So if we can scale the amount of protected areas on the planet as carbon sinks, that also solve the extinction crisis, by the way, and then thirdly, if we can change and scale the conversion of food production from industrial agriculture to regenerative food and fiber protocols, then we funded dozens and dozens of scientists over a seven year period going deep on each of those categories that have confirmed that if we scale those three things, we can keep the planet to 1.5 degrees. And one of my team is in Glasgow right now presenting that to uh, the Climate Change Convention. So check out One Earth because we built this platform where we're putting groups all over the world that are doing those their work on the ground in those three areas to solve climate change. And you can get involved and you can support those groups. You can volunteer with them if you've got if you can support them financially, you can, you can do that, but, but you can learn what you can do as an individual. Uh, and it's, this isn't like we can all recycle and that kind of stuff, but that's not gonna keep us from going over the cliff. But, but we can do actions that will save us and our kids and the planet and all the wilderness and wildlife that I suspect everybody here on this meeting tonight, uh, presentation tonight, uh, uh, you know, loves as much as I do. So uh, here's, a, here's a, a different one. What's your favorite snack to pack while climbing? <laughs> you know, I, 
I've worked at Patagonia for 15, 20 years, and I've been um, close to the company since it started in 1973, even before then, uh, with my climbing partnership with uh, Yvonne. And, and as some of you know, the company a few years ago um, had a uh, brand extension, it's called in business, to, uh, in addition to, to clothing, food. So the company now makes now makes food and um, and all of it is uh, either sustainably or regeneratively produced. And, and it's got a, a pretty big line of seafood products now. And my favorite thing of all is um, this uh, kind of tightly packaged uh, salmon uh, that is harvested very sustainably by uh, Native uh, Americans on uh, First Nation peoples on the British Columbia coast. And it's just terrific. So <laughs> you might check that out. And what scares me? Um, one of the things that, of the many things that I've uh, taken from all these years in the, in the, in the wild parts of the world is, um, is learning uh, in a really deep way how uh, death is a reflection of life, that without death, we have no life. And then with our life, we're all going to die. And we all know that intellectually, of course we do. But spending time in nature, um, you get that much deeper into your bones. And as you spend time deeply in nature and see deeply how death is a reflection of life and how it is an absolutely essential and necessary part of life. Um, it can give you a resilience against not only your own death, but you know, all the setbacks that all of us have in our daily lives. And, uh, and it can help you address your, your fears and your anxieties uh, in, in, in a really deep way. And I don't want to pretend that I've reached some bodhisattva level where when it comes my time to die, it may not be accompanied with any fear or anxiety at all. Um, I've been close to death enough times to know how really hard it is to control those fears and anxieties when you're actually there looking into the abyss, because I've been there a few times. Uh, so I'm not pretending that when that time comes for me, I won't own that anxiety again. Uh, but the last time I had to face that was just a few years ago when my mentor, Doug Tompkins, and I were on a kayak trip together in a very cold lake in Patagonia, and a crosswind hit us, and our double boat flipped, and we were both in the water while our companions had gone ahead and didn't really realize what had happened to us for quite a few minutes and the water was 39 degrees and I knew we had 10, 15, 20 minutes at the most and, and we struggled to try to get ashore. And finally our friends came back for us and, um, and they got me ashore. By the time I got ashore, I was unconscious from hypothermia and it took Doug a little longer for them to get him ashore and he was too cold. He didn't make it, he died. And I had, you know, quite a few minutes treading water before my friends arrived, not knowing that they would arrive um, to address my fears and, and that anxiety, to get comfortable with, with death. And, and I was able to do that. I talk about that in my book. And um, it becomes, uh, those experiences in nature become a, a, a way to deeply address uh, some of our greatest anxieties uh, in life. Are there any environmental expeditions similar to the one you wrote about in the big open that you would like to be part of? And what would you like to see happen? Well, that trip in the, in the big open was uh, a book I wrote about the uh, rickshaw trip across to Northwest Tibet following those shiru, or as Yvonne's wife, Melinda Chenard calls it, the, 
the trip when Rick and his friends push shopping carts across Tibet. <laughs> and <clears throat> when we got back from that trip, um, one of the four of my team members, Galen Rao, who tragically died in a plane crash only a month after we returned, and who some of you on the on this uh, presentation tonight, uh, no doubt uh, know about Galen, you may even have known him and how he, uh, you know, even much more than me, uh, had uh, an incredible array of expeditions and experiences in his career. And when we got back from that trip, he called me up a week later and, and he said, you know, I've been doing this for 50 years since I was a kid, Rick, and this was easily the most fulfilling expedition of my life. And, and he said that because that expedition wasn't about us, but it was about us using our mountaineering skills, you know, not to climb a mountain uh, that we could, you know, chalk up another ascent, but it was using our skills to try to save a, another species. And, and that was fulfilling to an extent beyond what any of us, I think, even anticipated or expected at the outset, where we were only hopeful we could have have a small part in saving the species, which we did. Um, the calving grounds that we had um, discovered on that trip were uh, uh, the, the media that, with our partnership with National Geographic that was produced, uh, convinced the Chinese to create a protected area around those calving grounds and the, and the animals started to uh, increase and they're still increasing. So it was, a, it was a victory, a conservation victory and such a fulfilling one. So, I don't know what to propose in answer to your question, uh, what other projects are out there, but you know, I found out about that one from my friend George Chowler, the great conservation biologist, because uh, I always had my antenna up for, you know, any kind of opportunity to, to do something like that. And, uh, and I just go back to my previous comment uh, uh, before about, you know, knowing what you're good at and uh, realizing that luck is more about uh, having that antenna tuned to uh, opportunities so you recognize them when they come along. And maybe we got two more. Yeah, we've got like two more minutes, unfortunately. Um, so yeah. you wanna pick maybe one more question to, to leave us with? Well, my friend David Dolan, and David, nice to have you joining us this evening. He asked that if I had one or two primary messages to share with younger people, the age of our children, <laughs> David and I are contemporaries in that way, you know, what, what would that message be? And, um, you know, David, and for all of you this evening, um, I think I've covered a lot of it already uh, with, um, with committing yourself to use whatever skills you own to do something about climate change and, and the climate crisis, the two big crises that, that face us. And, and we all have a responsibility to, do, to focus on that and do what we can to save this one and only home planet. And here I'll leave you with wisdom from my mentor, Yvonne Chouinard, who, when people ask him that question says, well, we all have to do something. We're not gonna save the planet if we don't do something. So if you know how to speak, speak out. If you know how to write, write. If you have extra money, donate. And whatever it is skill that you own, use that to do something to save our one and only home planet. So thank you so much again, all of you for attending. I think that was the perfect ending, uh, but I wish we had more time. We had a lot of great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. And I, I feel like I could listen to you speak about your life and adventures and lessons learned for at least another hour. But alas, it is time for us to go. As a gentle reminder, I've placed the book link um, for uh, purchasing on the Politics and Prose website um, life Lived Wild Adventures at the Edge of the Map. Again, it's in the chat and it'll take you to the Politics and Prose website where you can also check out our events page and uh, we'd love to see you at another event soon. Uh, thank you, Rick Ridgeway. It's been a delight. 
Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. And until next time, stay well and stay well